In this video, we will describe what it means for a physics scheme to work with the CCPP framework, or be CCPP compliant. We will primarily be introducing the technical requirements, or how a scheme is coded, to be able to work with the CCPP software framework. Meeting these technical requirements is the first step for a new scheme to be included in the authoritative CCPP repository on GitHub, but further scientific and or organizational requirements need to be met for completion of this process. One of the first questions that you might have is, what constitutes a scheme? Or how should I organize my code that does X, Y, and Z? Well, the CCPP software framework doesn't care whether a scheme consists of thousands of lines of code representing multiple physical processes, or a few lines of code performing one calculation. We've run an entire physics suite as one CCPP scheme and one-liners with equal success. There are no categories that a scheme needs to comply with, like planetary boundary layer or deep convection or microphysics, although many existing schemes within the CCPP could certainly be classified as such. So there's a lot of flexibility here. It is best practice, however, to define a scheme as all the code required to represent some well-defined physical processes impact on the model state. In addition, if you think that it's reasonable that a user might want to only run part of the code independently, or perhaps at a different frequency, consider making that part into a separate CCPP scheme. Consider the following processes A, B, and C. Let's assume that process A runs independently, but that process C depends on how process B is calculated. In this case, it makes sense to have a CCPP scheme for process A alone and a CCPP scheme for the combined processes B and C. One real world example of this is radiation, where it is conceivable that a user might want to use long wave and short wave components from different authors or at different frequencies. In this suite definition file, you can see that short wave and long wave radiation are kept separate to enable this flexibility. Another real world example is convection, where it might be suitable to group shallow, congestus, and deep convection into one scheme, if they should always be called together, or as separate schemes if they can act independently. Looking at the difference between two suite definition files, one that uses separate shallow and deep versions of the SAS scheme on the left, and one that uses one combined grell freitas convection scheme on the right, demonstrates this concept. Ultimately, it's a judgment call that must balance portability or ease of swapping a scheme into different suites and computational cohesiveness and performance. One further distinction that might be a bit arbitrary but can be useful is the difference between what we call a primary scheme versus what we call an interstitial scheme. A primary scheme is what one would traditionally think of when they consider a physics scheme. It calculates the effect of some physical process on the mean state. An interstitial scheme can be thought of as glue code that might be needed to, for example, prepare data needed by another scheme or perhaps calculate some optional diagnostics. Existing CCPP suites weave together both kinds of schemes. Primary schemes within a suite are generally responsible for its scientific behavior and performance, whereas interstitial schemes ensure that the primary schemes work well together and make sure that a collection of schemes calculate all diagnostics expected by a host model. Note that it is anticipated that most interstitial schemes may eventually be replaced by auto-generated code from the CCPP software framework such as variable conversions, common diagnostic calculations, etc., so that suites that have long suite definition files with many interstitial schemes today could potentially be considerably compacted in the future through automated cogeneration. Now that we've discussed guidelines for how to organize code into schemes, let's dive into what makes the collection of code CCPP compliant. Perhaps one of the defining features of the CCPP is that it relies on metadata that further describes a scheme's interface or arguments. The CCPP framework uses this metadata to match variables that a scheme needs with what the host model or other schemes provide. This information is then used to construct software caps, like a driver, that call physics schemes in the order and frequency defined in an external suite definition file. A scheme's metadata is placed into a separate file with the same root name but with a .meta extension. This file uses a relaxed config file format, 
with defined sections for each subroutine in the Fortran code with a CCPP compliant interface. Each section begins with a name of the subroutine and a type that describes what kind of entity the metadata it is describing, in this case, a scheme. Afterward, all variables that are part of a subroutine's argument list are included, with attributes for each variable following. Some attributes are required and some are optional. Required attributes are in bold on this slide and it include the variables standard name, units, dimensions, type, and intent. Other attributes are optional, like a long name or description, kind or precision corresponding to the type, and whether the variable is a Fortran optional argument. Here, we should make a distinction between a variable's local name, which is what it is actually called in the Fortran code, that can be anything that conforms to the Fortran standard, and a variable's standard name. The standard name is special because it is the key by which the CCPP framework knows a variable. The intent attribute corresponds to whether an argument is in, in out, or out, and should match the actual Fortran code. The dimensions variable is a comma separated parentheses bound list of dimensions by their standard names. It can be an empty set of parentheses for a scalar variable. It can specify a start and an end through use of standard names, or if a standard name is given for the dimension, it's implied that the dimension starts with one and spans to the specified value. Note that it is not acceptable to have the following syntax, even though it may be valid Fortran. Moving on from the metadata, every CCPP compliant scheme should have one entry point, although the scheme itself can have multiple source files if necessary. The entry point of a scheme should be placed in a Fortran module and consist of at least three subroutines, an init subroutine that is run prior to the first time step, a run subroutine that is executed during the model's time integration, and a finalized subroutine that is run after the time integration phase of the host model is finished. If a scheme doesn't need all phases to operate, the inoperable subroutines may be empty. All of the required subroutines and the module itself need specific names that match the scheme name. For example, if the scheme is called foo, the module name should be foo, and the required subroutine name should be foo init, foo run, and foo finalize. In addition, each subroutine that is not empty must be preceded by three lines of special comments for the purpose of connecting a scheme to its metadata table in its separate file and for working with the Doxygen documentation software. For example, the foo run scheme needs the following lines. As a real world example, consider the so-called hybrid EDMF planetary boundary layer scheme. Its CCPP compliant entry point is in the file monanedmf.f, but some of its code exists in a separate file, mfpbl.f, that is callable from the entry point scheme. Notice that the entire scheme is placed in the hedmf module and then it contains specially named subroutines called hedmf init, hedmf run, and hedmf finalize. Since the finalize subroutine is not needed for this scheme, it's empty. Lastly, notice that both non-empty subroutines have the special comment lines for connecting them to their metadata. Another factor that a scheme needs to take into account to be CCPP compliant is its error handling. A CCPP compliant scheme is not allowed to stop a host model or otherwise write out error messages. Instead, it should make use of the CCPP error message and CCPP error flag variables. If a scheme detects an error, it should set CCPP error flag to a non-zero value, set CCPP error message to a string describing the error, and return to the calling procedure. The CCPP software framework handles these variables and appropriately stops the host model. Documenting a CCPP compliant scheme makes use of specially formatted in-source comments. These comments are parsed by the Doxygen software to produce human-readable content while being subject to version control along with the rest of the code. Although such documentation is not required for the scheme to work within the CCPP software framework, it is highly encouraged for developers to adequately document their algorithms for future maintenance and potential improvement. Detailed instructions for adhering to the desired format 
are included on the CCPP website via link number two in the description. And many examples exist within the existing CCPP repository for format replication as well. Examples of the documentation produced can be found at link number three in the description. The documentation includes a description of the arguments, a high-level description of the algorithm, and often a detailed description of the algorithm with equations and references. Although in general, it is not the goal of the CCPP project to enforce a particular coding style or method, it is important that some minimum coding requirements are met. Following these requirements should aid future maintenance and portability of CCPP compliant schemes. Although examples of older standards of Fortran exist within the CCPP physics repository, new schemes should choose to follow the Fortran 90 standard up to the Fortran 2008 standard. Next, labeled end statements of modules and subroutines are required for proper parsing of the code by the CCPP framework. Also, using implicit none is required, preferably at the module level. If a variable is labeled as intent out, it must be set within the routine. In addition, variables that contain domain-dependent data cannot be kept using the save attribute. Further, go to statements should not be used and common blocks are forbidden. Finally, as a reminder, scheme should not stop or abort the model and IO should be contained within the init subroutine, like for reading lookup tables. Please see the written documentation for further details including rules for parallel programming. To wrap up, hopefully this video gave you a flavor of what is expected of a physics scheme to work with the CCPP framework. For more details, please see the section on CCPP compliant parameterizations in the technical documentation via link number one in the description, and visit the CCPP physics GitHub page via link number four.